going to wait around for a few more people to join in and then we will begin today's super exciting live that we have planned. Um, just waiting for a few more people to kind of sink in and then we'll begin. Um, it's been a while since we did the It's been a long, long time, time since yeah. we did the last live as well. And I think it's, it's kind of a fun place to be, uh, to be doing this, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think, um, yeah, just give us another minute because we said we'll start at 8.30. Uh, we've got a very special person here who I will introduce very shortly. Uh, but until then, um, yeah, I'm excited to be here. We've got a different environment here today and uh, we're trying out, you know, a uh, different kind of a setting. So, uh, yeah, excited to be doing this. I'm happy to be the lab rat for this new setting. It seems a lot more comfortable. Appropriate uh, use of the word also, I would say, for this so live. <laughs> I think it's the first time we're having a live with somebody from our own team. It's usually just Prithvi and I and you don't, you don't get to see other people in the team, but I think that's going to change for today. Yeah. Okay, okay, let's begin. Namaste everyone. Uh, welcome to another live, a much talk. And uh, we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, trying to bring in a new perspective, well, new or not, we'll find out, but uh, today's topic for the life is uh, medicinal properties of mushrooms, uh, something that we heard a lot about, that we often kind of get questioned about, but this is an attempt to perhaps debug some of those ideas or probably, you know, even highlight some of these concepts that many of y'all have quite often asked us. So um, today we've got with us uh, Niladri, hi, <laughs> and of course Jashin, who is yeah. our uh, you know co-founder at Numero. So uh, Niladri has worked, has done his masters in stem cell biology from the University of Minnesota, and he's been working on uh, you know various antimicrobial properties surrounding bacteria. Um, in his last few years, he's also been uh, you know doing a lot of research in the space of. Um, you know, various kinds of organisms. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say fungi comes close to it, but it is a various kinds of spaces that he has divulged. I'll let him speak a little bit more, more about it. But um, the interesting part is, you know, while he does a lot of research, fungi seem to be something that came about in his journey, and it has stuck with him, and that's why he is a part of Nubedo and he works pretty relentlessly to push those barriers and push those ideas even for us as a team each right. and every day so we're super grateful for that and um, yeah so what kind of got you in fungi and maybe you can just tell people a little bit about um, you know your little bit about your background if you'd like to share so yeah firstly thank you Prithvi and Jashin for having me on the live you know, I normally see this on my phone and uh, now I'm on the other side, so the pressure is on. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> yeah, so, my f interest with fungi first started, you know, back when I was in the US. See, because I used to live in a hilly area, there was a lot of trees, especially oak and things like that. Mm -hmm. And especially in the fall, right before the winter, you would just see these little mushrooms just popping out of every nook and cranny from some trees from in between the grasses right. you know all different kinds and the rest of the year they were just not there right. You know? right. and that really sparked my interest just you know just seeing all of these come out and then realizing that they've always been there but we just don't notice that always, always. and then as i started reading a little bit more about it and learning about it and even in my uh, antimicrobial work deal a little bit with fungi which are like pathogenic right yeah. but more importantly fungi are probably the most diverse organisms that exist on this planet today Correct, yeah. and most of them have still not been discovered and we haven't even begun to like scratch the surface of aquatic fungi mm. we leave alone like what's available on land so with that they have an extremely wide repertoire of compounds and enzymes which they have evolved over millions of years, which can have functions that we just have not discovered yet and could be extremely useful for us, both from an um, uh, industrial standpoint, as well as you know our health. And uh, which is why, particularly with Nuelo, the goal is to develop the medicinal aspects of fungi mm -hmm. so that we can 
start forging a path towards a healthier future right. in a sustainable way. Right. Right. I mean, um, medicine being a very you know crucial part of our how we live our lives, and we've of course known about it through so many different herbs and so many different plants. But uh, you know, even I, when I first came across mushrooms, I, I I honestly did not know the variety of properties that it actually has. So just to kind of you know put that out there for the audience, like what are medicinal mushrooms? Like how would what do we how do we call them medicinal and what are what are those aspects of them that because medicine is not the first word that comes to your mind when you say mushrooms sure. usually food yeah. so what exactly is a yeah just to kind of set stage guys so that you know we can get deeper and everyone has the right foundation to begin with right so yeah. that's a great question and uh, i would say that a medicinal mushroom is basically it's not a drug it's not going to fix your sickness. It's not something that can replace a pharmaceutical drug which is specifically designed to treat a particular disease. Right. But what it is, is uh, a mushroom which produces compounds that can enhance our health in our day-to-day -day lives. It's not something that you can take if you have like stage 4 cancer and have your cancer go away. Right, right. It's, they can help your body fight against the cancer. We'll get into these things later on. But that's how I would specifically call reference to a medicinal mushroom. Right, right. And like, are there any particular names that you know we can probably put out there or have in our vocabulary so that you know, we know about them? Uh, just before that, hi Sharni. Uh, nice shout out to you. Hello. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. Right. So. I mean, there are many, many mushrooms that we have not yet explored, which may have medicinal properties. However, um, I'll just name a few that are the most common and uh, we can take it from there. Yeah. So one thing I'd like to highlight though, is that the medicinal properties of fungi are not restricted to any one particular class of fungi, mm -hmm. especially right. when we talk about mushrooms. Very so important point. Um, within mushrooms, you know, they are categorized into different uh, families based on how they look, how they behave, where they grow. So, for example, um, shiitake mushrooms, right. they are very common culinary mushrooms, they are delicious, but they also have very great medicinal properties. And they look like the traditional uh, mushrooms with a little stipe and a little cap, right. agarical stipe. Right. Uh, apart from that, we also have um, cordyceps. Mm -hmm. Cordyceps is actually not a traditional mushroom forming fungus, it belongs to the class of ascomyces, called mm -hmm. or sap fungi. And they are very unique in that they grow on larvae or caterpillars of insects and then they take control of these insects and then they go to a high place and that's when they start fruiting. However, interestingly, this cordyceps produces compounds which are really good for our endurance. Oh, okay. Right? And, and somehow this mushroom has figured out how to do this and this is an ascomycete. It's not a basidiomycete which most other mushrooms belong to. The third one that I'd like to bring light to is called lion's mane. Um, one of our favorites as well. One of our favorites, favorites, yes. And this is a particular type of fungus called a hypnoid fungus. Okay. So a characteristic feature of this is that it does not have gills like say the shiitake or a right. button mushroom or even oyster mushroom may have. They have these tooth-like projections which are actually carrying the spores. And uh, that's what gives them that lion's mane-like appearance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've probably seen that, uh, you know, those who have probably, uh, you know, with June and Tinovago, we, we, we did have like a small batch that we had really, you, you see them as like these white feathery structures. Uh, again, this is just to kind of, you know, get everyone to know what they are and how uh, some of the most common ones are out there. Sorry, go ahead, Neil. Yeah. Sure, I'll just end with the last category, which are polyporous. Uh, fungi, they're so called because they can produce large amount of spores constantly streaming through their fruiting bodies and they are generally found growing on wood. So two right. of the most common ones are turkey tail, mm. jungle tea species and Ganoderma which is also called the herb of immortality and all of that in Chinese traditional medicine or uh, reishi as reishi. it is known. Right, right. So I mean, so we know about these mushrooms, right? And of course, we work with these mushrooms and I think uh, they have their own challenges and they are very unique in their own ways but like 
if I had to go deeper and take it a step, you know, or probably more, um, you know, take out one layer and understand what are the actual compounds that yeah. are present in it. What to, gives them the medicinal properties? Right, like what is it about them? I mean, I could possibly eat a banana or like a chicken and get the same thing. What is it about a mushroom? And what are those compounds that make them, you know, medicinal. super? Yeah, or like I we like to call them superfoods. Uh, but yeah. Right, that's a good question. So, uh, traditionally when we talk about medicinal compounds mm -hmm. from mushrooms, uh, they can be classified into three broad categories. Uh, they are phenolics, okay. terpenes mm -hmm. and polysaccharides. Now I'll take it from the in up to the increasing order of complexity from the molecular standpoint. So we can start with phenolics. Phenolics are basically compounds which have a benzene ring, which is a six-membered carbon ring and they have some side chains on that. So what phenolics compounds are really good at is in, they act as antioxidants. So one of the most common um, damages that occur in any cell in the living body while it's growing, dividing, performing is caused by reactive oxygen species. So these are basically right. oxygen molecules which have a very strong negative charge and they can go and bind to your DNA and this destabilizes the DNA and this is what leads to mutations and other things which happens in every cell. Now the cell has mechanisms to deal with this but it's not perfect. Yeah. So antioxidants actually help by interacting with these reactive oxygen species and that's why they're called antioxidant. They prevent the oxidization of DNA and other biomolecules within your cells mm -hmm. and they help preserve the function of these cells. So regular consumption of antioxidants can help maintain your the integrity of your DNA for a longer period of time. Eventually the damage will This is the same thing as oxidative stress? Is, is this yeah, what is called okay. oxidative stress? Well, in some sense, oxidative stress also has to do with high levels of oxygen. Right. Uh, whereas this is more about very within the cell, very specific reactive species like of free oxygen. radicals. Free radicals. So okay. oxygen, nitrogen, all of these can form very negatively charged molecules, which can then go and attack, attack. the DNA and other proteins as well. Uh, so this is what phenolics do, and they are present in a large number of mushrooms like reishi, turkey tail. Um, shiitake, they are generally colored compounds. If you see a very colorful mushroom, right, it's right. likely to have a large proportion of phenolics within them. That's nice to know. So, colored, you know, mushrooms probably have a larger amount of phenolics, and phenolics are a nice uh, way to kind of uh, identify them. As well. I mean, like look for it if you right. if you had to look. Yeah. Right. And uh, the second class of compounds, terpenes, uh, they are larger than mm -hmm. phenolics. So particularly when we talk about mushrooms, we talk about diterpenes and triterpenes. Okay. Okay. The terpenes are a broad class of organic compounds which have like monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, diterpenes, triterpenes. Wow. So these are four. This is all has to do with how many carbon atoms are present on the okay. 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 Diterpenes and triterpenes have 25 and 30 carbon atoms. So diterpenes are found in large quantities in Lion's mane. Mm. Ah. So two of the well-known bioactive molecules from lion's mane, helicinones and erinacines, are both forms of diterpenes. Mm. Right. And uh, these are smaller molecules which have the ability to pr cross the blood-brain barrier. Although this is not been mm. proven. In fact, in fact, just I'm gonna just pause there because we spoke. You spoke about not proven. Uh, ben Yeshinoy, he actually has a question. He says. How do we separate hype from credible scientific evidence when it comes to science communication of medicine mushrooms? So yeah, I'm very going interesting to take it right at that juncture because I just yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Belisha, for that question. Uh, so that's a very good question, and it's very hard to say like how do you not hype something up? How do you maintain a balance? And I would say the way that I approach it is to just present all the information. Uh, not to say that oh this is the only information, also present negative information, not only the positive information mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just inform the people and let them make the decision or the choice for them. Our job as communicators of science is not to say that this is what it is or this is not what it is, it's to present the information and have the audience you know just learn from it, absorb it and then take their own call. 
that's what I would, that's how I would approach yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's true. It's easy to hype it up because you know a lot of the studies even when we talk about medicine mm-hmm. and fungi are all done in a lab, in yeah, a in a dish. Clones. It's an artificial system. Some studies have been done on mice, rats. Mm-hmm. They don't really, you know, recapitulate human physiology. Correct. Correct. Uh, but that also goes to say that you know we can't keep testing on humans. Right. Right? There are a lot of regulations around it. So to get to a clinical trial, you have to do a lot of preclinical studies, which happens in the dish in mice and animal models apart from mice and rats. And only then a body like say the FDA or uh, will approve you hmm. to d- undertake a clinical trial. That's for a drug. Yeah. You can always do it with extracts and chemicals. But then that being said. You know, it's hard not to hype it because there's so a lot of only positive uh, research that is done on it. Science traditionally does not report mm. negative mm. Uh, results. There's no journal of negative results. Scientists typically choose not to report negative results, and that is a pet peeve that I have with the scientific process. But you know, let's not get into that. But <laughs> do you think that you know going behind established clinical trials is like a good way to see the like the therapeutic benefits in a more realistic setting, would you say that that's a good place to look at? Sure, I mean, and there have been many clinical trials that have been performed with mushroom extracts, both in the West and the East. Um, However, one thing uh, that I've come across while I'm reading about these clinical trials is that many of the studies have been inconclusive. Okay. And this in large part has to do with one is the study design. For any clinical trial, the design is extremely important because you don't get many chances at a clinical right, trial. Right. You have to select the right population of patients you want to test it on and your statistics, the test compounds or extracts that you want to use have to be really good and verified. Mm. And the second thing is the lack of sanitization in these extracts, right? A right. mushroom that is right. grown in China and a mushroom that is grown in Bangalore will have different compounds. Yeah. If you just extract, say, reishi and say, I've got reishi extract without looking at what is actually in that extract, you will have different results across different countries. Which, which brings us to a really important point of if you are using mushroom supplements, it is very, very critical for you to know where the mushroom is coming from. That's true. So if your brand or wherever you are buying from, they don't tell you where they're purchasing their mushrooms, if they're growing it, if it's wild harvested, where they're sourcing from, I think that's a red flag in terms of efficacy because that is, if not one of the most important factors in whether the medicine is going to work or not, where it came from and how it was grown. Exactly. You should know what you are consuming. Correct. And you should know how much fit you are consuming. That's very important. Right. Right. So, I mean, just kind of coming back to where you were at when you were talking about lion's mane and, and having, you know, uh, the, right, yeah. the, the diterpenes. Yeah, so I just want to sink back on that. Bit. Sure. Yeah. yeah, so diterpenes are present in lion's mane and then we look at other medicines, especially reishi. The most common form of ter- terpenes in that are triterpenes. So all of these compounds, gamma acid, there are many forms of it. Gamma-derol, uh, there are many forms of it. These are triterpenes and these tend to have a steroid-like molecular structure. So mm-hmm. you know, uh, like we have testosterone, estrogen, etc. Mm. These resemble that kind of structure. Right. So they are larger molecules and they can actually go and directly interact with uh, proteins within your cells and have transcriptional effects downstream of that. And finally, the last important class that we know of and we have studied well are polysaccharides. Right. What polysaccharides are, are actually really long chains mm. of sugar Complex, molecules, yeah, sure. carbohydrates. Right. Um, sugar does not mean table sugar. Carbohydrates can be glucose, fructose, mannose, arabinose, arabinose, there are many forms right. of these. And polysaccharides are long chains of these molecules strung together. And they can form branching networks, they can form long chains and interestingly and more importantly, they are an important structural element of the fungus. Right. Mm. So they are for part of the cell wall of the right. fungus. So every fungus has polysaccharides in them, whether they want to or not. Okay. So just going back, you said that the uh, phenolics were responsible for the antioxidant effects. Can you just maybe elaborate a little bit on what the terpenoids and what the polysaccharides do in terms of medicinal benefits? Oh uh, yeah, sure. So both of the terpenes and polysaccharides typically tend to act on the immune system and this is more true for the polysaccharides. And when we talk about polysaccharides, you know, there are many kinds of polysaccharides. 
when it comes to mushrooms, we specifically want to focus on beta glucans. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a class of polysaccharides, and even within beta glucans, we have to focus on beta one six linked beta glucans. Right. So what this one six means is basically how these molecules are connected to each other. Yeah. Mm. One three and one six. And these are particular for mushrooms. These are particular for mushrooms. So beta glucans are also found in cereal grains, barley, mm. oats, mm. etc. These contain 1,3 and 1,4 linked beta glucans, which are more linear chains. So they form longer chains, more uh, long straight like chains. They may form like helices and other kinds of conformations. Mm -hmm. But in mushrooms specifically, you have 1,3 and 1,6. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I don't want to confuse you guys with too many numbers, but essentially what this means is they have long chains, chains. and they can form branches, like, right. which can come up from the chain and move up. So interestingly, these are the only beta glucans that are digestible by the human digestive system. 1, oh, 3, okay. 1, 4 cannot be digested by human right. digestive system. Good to know. 1, 3, 1, 6 are broken down in the human body. Right. And all of these act on the gut microbiota as well. So, if you want to know how these work, what is their function, you need to understand a little bit about the immune system first. Okay. Right. So, the immune system is basically not there just to fight off COVID. It is not there just to fight off an infection. It is constantly active. Mm. It is constantly patrolling your body, looking for signs of damage, not only from outside agents like microbes, but also internal damage like uh, a cut, a tear, cancer. All of these things are mm. constantly regulated by the immune system. Right. Mm. Broadly, this can the immune system can be divided into innate immunity mm. and adaptive immunity. Okay. So innate is basically something that has to act really quickly, it's just the first action. So when a microbe enters your body, the innate immune system springs into action trying to control that infection. Correct. And this is what is important when we talk about beta glucans mm. or terpenes. So what these beta glucans are able to do is they interact with different cells of the immune system, mm. particularly they are called um, uh, dendritic cells, macrophages, um, and sentinel cells, these basically go around trying to find any foreign material. Right. And they also signal other immune cells through molecules called cytokines. Now, without getting into too much detail, basically by interacting with these immune cells, they're able to keep the immune system in a state of alert without like pushing it over the edge in which is typical of what happens in an infection. Right. Right, right. So your immune system is not complacent because right. you've not done anything to stress it. Yeah. But it's active. It's active. So when you are faced with uh, stress in the future, which could be an infection, could be a viral infection, yeah. bacterial infection, uh, your immune system is ready to deal with it. Right. 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 And this is partly how they have <laughs> their uh, immune supportive properties. So can you say that it's not just immune boosting but it's like more of a modulation? Yeah, it modulates it and uh, it supports it. Okay, like why I'm saying this is because um, uh, my personal experience with the uh, reishi extract has been that after I moved to Bangalore I had, I used to wake up with allergies, I'm sure people in my team know that some of the days I used to just end up sneezing for like 5-6 hours. Yeah. And uh, I think after I started taking reishi, not I think, yeah definitely after I started taking reishi over a period of time, after 3 weeks, a lot of this actually came down and my immune system was, stable. what do you say, more stable. So would you say that in a case where an immune system is like hyperactive, it sort of uh, regulates it? Is it safe to say that? It is possible and you know this has to do with the cytokines that they release. Mm. So when we talk about cytokines, there are uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines mm. which stimulate an inflammatory response and there are anti-inflammatory cytokines. So these beta glucans are able to help the immune cells recognize somehow, we don't mm. know how it works, mm. but somehow they are able to help the immune cells recognize which cytokines it should release at what point. So mm. in the case of a hypersensitive response like an allergic uh, response, they will probably secrete anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10 mm. uh, which can dampen your immune response to whatever is causing, causing your allergic response. Correct, correct. So, right, and, and so we largely know that immune immune regulation, immunity regulation is something that these do. Right? Exactly. You can say that. So, I mean, we spoke about compounds that are actually present in mushrooms, but why do they work on us? I mean, yeah. how is that correlated and what sense does that even This is a question that we keep getting, okay, fine, mushrooms make these compounds in nature, but 
Why are we working how on and us? Why does, yeah. You mentioned the how, but why does it work on us? Right. And uh, I would say the question should never be why, it should always be how, because these things have been there for billions of years. We have evolved with them around us. You should never ask why it does, because it's not a conscious choice that this is making in order to impact our lives. Somehow these molecules, firstly we must understand that all life stems from the same molecules. There is the same genetic code that, you, that runs through all living organisms, whether, whether it's a bacteria, a fungus or a human being. Mm -hmm. We share an incredible similarity in our genetic sequence to fungi. So it is not... Uh, crazy to think that some of the molecules that these things produce will work on our cells as well. And oftentimes the molecules that they are produced apart from beta-glucans and polysaccharides which are structural molecules mm -hmm. are in response to some stress. Mm -hmm. So for instance, you can stress reishi, ganoderma in a cultivation setup mm -hmm. and stimulate it to produce more triterpenoids. Right, right. It's a stress response. So mm -hmm. somehow, whatever is helping this mushroom deal with environmental stresses also helps us deal with stress. Right. Because we have the same biochemistry. I find that crazy. Yeah, we're all part mushroom. Yeah, I find yeah. that pretty crazy. And this is true for plants as well, phytochemicals and all of this. So we are all connected. And they also act on bacteria. Mm -hmm. Our gut is full of bacteria. We have more bacterial cells than human cells. Yeah. And uh, these fungi also help support the health of these bacteria and that helps support our health because they are constantly interacting with our cells okay. in our brain. Okay. So, it, I guess it's safe to say that it's not like acting in one way but it's acting in a multitude of different ways to bring you to a state of wellness. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, I'll just take a few questions. I think uh, Bele had answered to your previous one on hype saying um, the hype especially when it comes to magic mushrooms. I mean, one should really like look at it. A good answer that way. And he also says beautiful answer to how uh, what you just mentioned. Oh, thank you. Um, they also say that someone also asked, you know, uh, how can it possible to extract cordyceps from cordyceps? Uh, just cordyceps. Yeah. Well, it is possible, of course. You can extract any specific compound from a given. Uh, starting material whether it's plant or mushroom but the thing is the more purity you want the more steps you will need in order to get that pure molecule and okay. in every step that you add you're going to have a loss in your yield mm. so let's say uh, the first step of extraction would be using some sort of solvent could be water or ethanol or methanol or whatever to extract some specific molecules from it it's not going to extract only one molecule you have to take that extract which contains thousands or millions of molecules and keep fractionating it, purifying it using different methods. You can use different solvents, you can use um, things called chromatography, which is a method of separating molecules based on their chemical mm -hmm. properties. Right. So, you know, there are many ways and you can definitely get very pure cordycepine, almost 99% pure. But it's going to cost you money and it's going to take you a lot of time and you're going to have very little yield at the end of it. Right. And I feel also that many of these molecules have an entourage effect like the phenolics, the terpenes and the polysaccharides when they come together in your body the effect that it has is, is also something that you need to consider because many of the times even a lot of different industries they go behind like one single particular compound and we forget to look at or we lose track of a lot of the other things which also could be Aiding the, aiding the healing process. It's a synergistic, it's a synergistic effect. effect. Yeah, that's 100% true. Yeah, many times if we go behind one particular compound, we try to maximize something, we lose that entourage effect or the synergistic effect. Right? And yeah. we can actually see that with the food that we eat now, right? So, like, mm -hmm. people are focused on size and uh, faster growth, but we're losing out on nutrition. Right, right. correct. Very good example. That's an amazing example. And, yeah, sorry, you were saying? No, no, no. No, I was just thinking, you know, you spoke about like, um, you spoke about terpenes, you spoke about phenolics, but I feel like the, I mean, and then this is again to like ride on the hype that you mentioned, a lot that is, what we keep hearing in the mushroom space is about beta glucans. So, um, you know, maybe how, how do they like really work on us and what is the mechanism of which they operate so that we have a clearer picture when we are consuming these mushrooms, what they can do for us and if we get empowered to actually use them the right way. Right. So maybe you could share a bit about that. Sure. So as I mentioned before, beta-glucans particularly work on our immune system and our innate immune system mm -hmm. so to speak. So 
when you consume a mushroom or an extract, beta glucans are part of the skeletal system of the mushroom. Okay. So even if you consume a whole mushroom, you are getting beta glucans into your system. Mm -hmm. It's not only an extract. So it's a structural polysaccharide. It's a structural polysaccharide. And that's why also people choose to focus on it because it's present in all mushrooms and you're guaranteed to get it. Okay. Right, right. Uh, because it's, it's all the structure. Yeah. So when you consume uh, mushroom or extract which contains beta glucans, uh, one important thing to remember is it can actually be digested and passed through our intestinal mm. walls to enter our circulation which other uh, po longer insoluble polysaccharides like fibers, dietary fibers, they cannot be taken up through the intestine. Right. Uh, beta glucans can do that. Right. So they can have a systemic effect. Um, Both. Just to order cause. So there, this brings us to a very interesting point to say that fiber is not just what like it's just not just roughage, it's not just uh, insoluble, there's also soluble fibers like uh, beta glucans that we don't even hear about. And right. shout out to uh, Guillaume, our chief cultivator, for educating us about this. Uh, soluble and insoluble dietary fibers. Uh, yeah, shout out to you. Anyway, go ahead. Right, so um, what happens when we consume this beta glucan is once it enters our intestine, it interacts with the immune system, our intestine is full line with many many millions of immune cells mm. and it of course it has like a mic will and like projections which is like the finger like projections etc uh, but majorly lined by immune cells because that is the part of our body that is constantly bombarded by external stuff like food mm. so there's a lot lot of immune cells there so when these beta glucans are encounter these immune cells, they bind to some receptors called dectin one, etc. So there are broad class of receptors which are basically proteins on the immune cells mm -hmm. which can recognize other molecules in a lock and key mechanism mm -hmm. based on their structure. So these are called pattern recognition receptors. Beta glucans are one of those molecules mm -hmm. that these can recognize. When the immune cell recognizes it, uh, it triggers a cascade of gene mm -hmm. of, of uh, signaling pathways within the immune cell and it causes it to secrete cytokines. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. of these cytokines will uh, bring more immune cells closer to this area. So you can imagine in a gut, when there are more immune cells near the lining, any infectious organism which it's, has to infect it's immediately, so easy. Yeah. It's immediately taken yeah. care of. Yeah. Right. Apart from that, they can also venture off through the blood to other parts of the body and interact with immune cells in other parts of the body as well. And one other important thing to remember is an immune cell which is activated in the intestinal lining can still travel to other parts of your body. And right. Have right. Right. So uh, one common thing that you know is there in the literature with beta glucans is its anti-tumor effect or mm -hmm. cytotoxic mm -hmm. effect. Right. Now these beta glucans directly will not kill your cancer. Yeah. What it does is it helps stimulate the immune cells which can kill your cancer. Okay. Right. So there's a class of cells called cytotoxic T cells mm. um, which are specifically designed to kill cells in your own body that are either infected by a virus or could be a cancer cell mm. or any other sort of cell which your body wants to get rid of. The beta glucans help in the differentiation of these cytotoxic T cells and these cells can then go and like find any cell which is aberrant and then kill it. So it helps in that sort of sentinel response. So it's yeah. like a domino effect. Yeah. It's, it sets off like a chain reaction of exactly. things that uh, ultimately leads to, you know, a curative effect. Yeah. Okay. So the immune system has many, many different kinds of cells. You know, it's like as people study more about immunity, more cell types keep coming up. Emerging, right? yeah. Emerging because it's like. Who, based on function or some gene expression, say, oh, this is not this cell. It used to be this cell, but now, you know, it's mm -hmm. like these two, three subtypes. So, what beta glucans do is help in a general immune proliferative response. The second thing, which is very interesting actually, is that they also work with the gut microbiome. Oh, okay. So, beta glucans act as a food source mm -hmm. for the gut microbiome, specifically the beneficial microbes. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, if you keep the beneficial microbes healthy, they keep the pathogenic and unbeneficial microbes away. Right, right. And uh, what they do is, they once they start metabolizing beta glucans, they produce what are called short chain fatty acids. So traditionally, you may have heard of 
ketosis right right uh, ketone diet yeah, mm, yeah. etc so in these cases what happens is instead of breaking down glucose people are breaking down fats mm. and these fats produce short chain fatty acids which can then be which are basically the beneficial molecules of this entire process okay. so butyrate propionate acetate these are the short chain fatty acids and they can go and have, act on different parts of your body and stimulate a and they have like an anti stress response stress response mechanism they act on the brain and help in memory response they have secretory bdnf in certain cases so fasting is often similar, has like a similar effect similar too. effect because of oh. the production of these molecules, molecules. so beta glucans are able to produce, produce the same ones yeah the bacteria in your gut when they feed on the beta glucans are able to produce this and this can go straight to your brain as well it's called the gut brain axis right so it helps so, so but what is the beta glucan the beta glucan is a fuel source for the bacteria so it's is it a probiotic can you right. call it a probiotic it's a prebiotic prebiotic okay probiotic is a living organism that you would right eat. right so it's a prebiotic it's a prebiotic it supports the beneficial bacteria right. in your gut right prebiotic. Oh, awesome in fact you said also cognitive responses right like cognitive it helps yeah. in fact someone just asked us this i'll make a few questions now Tushar asks, can you highlight the cognitive benefit effects of nine's meat? So you know, just to sure. dive into that. Of course, now you know that beta glucans have a role to play and how. But the actual effects of lion's mane, yeah. Sure. So uh, lion's mane is very commonly uh, used as a nuo, uh, nootropic, nootropic uh, mushroom. So specifically, we could talk about erythrocenes. Now, erythrocenes are terpenoids which are produced in the mycelium of the lion's mane and not in the fruiting body according okay. to no so uh, erythrocenes are only produced in the mycelium and what these erythrocenes do is they can actually act on uh, of course these are all studies that have been done in a lab so but in in vitro studies in vitro studies and also some studies that have been done in rat and mice but mm. anyway what they do is they can uh, in your brain there are cells called astrocytes right so you know must know about neurons i'm sure everybody knows about neurons but neurons are like we say functional they're not they may be the most important cell right? but apart from neurons there are many other cells that support the function of these neurons mm-hmm. one of them being astrocytes we have five times more astrocytes in the brain than neuronal cells astrocytes are very important because what they do is maintain the integrity of the blood brain barrier they help support neuronal function so you know when neurons connect mm-hmm. communicate mm-hmm. with each other there are synapses right, right. astrocytes maintain these synapses mm-hmm. yeah. they are able to uh, modulate synaptic responses they help support the production of dendrites which are like projections from the neurons which will then go and form synapses so like branch and short you can say that the, they are like the repair and maintenance people for your nerves exactly nice and what these erythrocenes do is they help in the production of a protein which is called ngf nerve yeah. growth factor and nerve growth factor is basically a protein which signals to the neuronal cells that hey all is good all is happy you know thrive and that is how erythrocenes have their function by stimulating ngf they help maintain a very healthy neural environment and this helps in reducing the so people have you know claimed oh it can help with dementia it can mm-hmm. help with this it can help with that of course we don't know but what it can do is it can help prolong a healthy nervous system uh, right. so that your chances of getting dementia and etc yes, so it's yes. like a neuroprotective effect protective yeah hmm. right awesome and i think you know uh, that's also that's just one kind of mushroom that does one kind of thing and there are so many more that we still have to explore so thousands thousands, thousands. yeah millions i'll take another question indian toads to a shout out to you mm-hmm. uh, he asks us a question um, he says that is it isn't it possible for the same mushroom to possess an um, antagonistic molecule along with an enhancing one wouldn't that demand extraction steps yeah it's definitely possible and uh, what i would say is it's not only up to the mushroom it also depends on your body right mm-hmm. so these compounds can only act on the cells and the cells are receptive to it mm-hmm. so your body has to be in a state where it can respond to the stimuli that you're providing in the form of these mushroom extracts etc 
and like you said different compounds may have antagonistic effects but your body may be in a particular state where you can only respond to one kind of compound mm. over the other so the antagonistic effect is good because it helps maintain homeostasis mm. you're not pushing mm. your body mm. towards only one direction you may pull it back when it goes too far in one direction you may push it a little bit when it goes too far back and that's why antagonism is very important so mm. that's a good question and it's definitely possible but it's very it's a very important aspect of it and that speaks to your point about synergistic effect right, right? you can't focus only on one compound mm. we don't know how all of these things are interacting everything in the body is interacting yeah there is nothing which works in isolation so, absolutely yeah, yeah because see uh, even in even in the us with so much hype about psilocybin they're all going behind that one molecule they're forgetting the psilocin there's nor psilocin there's biocystin there's nor biocystin there are beta carbolins and all of these things when it comes together that's when you have the healing right and them trying to make it synthetic and just extracting that one single molecule and trying to scale just psilocybin in the long run i am not really sure how that's going that's to have an effect that's i think what right. dr belation i also asked about you know the hype about just Right. Yeah. Exactly. Because ultimately, for a pharmaceutical company, they want to find something that they can scale cheap and fast. But that might not be the whole picture. The whole picture, yes, right. or the best. So, Dr. Parishana has another question, and I really like this question. It says, "What is your view on possible utilities of whole genomic data in relation to exploitation of these medicinal mushrooms?" Oh, I love this question because this is like. Oh, okay, I have, so genoming data is going to change the world. Just mark my words. Yeah, the future is going to change because of genomics. Double quotes. The more genoming data we extract, and it's becoming more accessible, cheaper, technology is evolving. The more we can get an idea about how nature works, and nature has figured out everything. We don't know anything. So. The more genomic data we extract, whether it's from a cultivated mm. mushroom or something you find in a forest, or you know you can do meta genomic sequencing of just random water samples, you get a lot of information. But what happens is now through genomics is one level where you get the sequence information. The next level is bioinformatics, where using the sequences you can predict, oh this is possibly a protein, mm. this is possibly coding for this gene, etc., etc., and you can start building up these pathways in a computer without actually studying this organism. Right. and this is fueled by advances in bioinformatics and artificial intelligence right. machine learning etc these models are going to get better faster as as technology improves and soon you will be able to sequence an organism and recreate it its uh, metabolism its protein constituents etc in a computer the third thing is now once you know uh, say some fungus that are found in the amazon is producing a compound And now you through bioinformatics you find out there are these things called docking etc. This is commonly used in drug discovery. You take this compound and you start seeing what kind of molecules it can interact with in the computer mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. In silico design is what it's called. So now you can say, okay, I found this molecule. It interacts with this particular receptor, which is expressed a lot in this colon cancer. And if I can produce this molecule, I can possibly treat colon cancer. But you can't go to the Amazon and harvest mm-hmm. this fungus every time you need to treat colon cancer. Right. But now that you have the genomic information, you can recreate this pathway in another organism, mm-hmm. like a yeast or uh, another fungus that you may be uh, cultivating, and you can start producing this compound without having to harvest it from the Amazonian rainforest mm-hmm. right. through fermentation. So, genomics is the first step. Next will come bioinformatics and data analysis, and the final part is genetic engineering and synthetic biology, which will tie all of this information together to produce these compounds without requiring those organisms. And that's when we will start exponentially increasing our access to natural compounds, and that's going to take some time. It will take a few decades, yeah. but that is the future, as, yeah. as I would like to see it. I think till then, we'll, it's safe to say that all the mushroom cultivators out there are safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think we're going to just you know wrap up on one last question. Um, what is the best way to consume mushrooms in order to get the best effect? Yeah, because that, people keep asking. That's most, like, and okay, this is a question we actually pulled yeah, out all the time. Yeah, that yeah. we pulled out from where from our you know maybe the database with some of the most commonly asked questions. What's the best way to consume a mushroom? Yeah. Well, there is no best way, <laughs> right? There is no best way. It depends on what you are looking for. If you have a specific benefit, 
you are looking for say you want to have a little bit of uh, de-stressing at night you could consume some reishi uh, extract or tea or uh, you can't eat the reishi it's too woody and bitter but you can have an ex extract from the reishi um, if you were looking for brain helping or brain protective effects you could consume lion's mane you, so it depends a lot on what you're looking for uh, if you just want the taste just eat the mushroom but just consume mushrooms mushrooms right. are good for you in whatever form you consume you will get the beneficial compounds be it beta glucans terpenes phenolics the beneficial thing of extracts is that you're concentrating these molecules mm -hmm. making it in an easier to consume form so you don't have to consume a lot 30 of mushrooms to get right. the effect of one you know sachet of extract or one capsule mm -hmm. of extract so that's why extracts are useful but that being said that's definitely not the only way and i wouldn't say it's the best way uh, whatever way keeps you consuming mushrooms just consume in that way right. awesome so i think what he's trying to say is get some mushrooms into you doesn't matter if it's a soup if it's a like a dry mushroom or a saute or an extract if there's something specifically that you're after go after the extracts but just having mushrooms in your diet goes a long way improving your general health right, right. and even the humble oyster mushroom is actually has a lot of beneficial right. properties they're not like uh, you know as revered as say reishi but the oyster mushroom is very rich in beta glucans it also contains antioxidants mm. simple things like that i would say butter mushroom is probably furthest down the chain it's not the best in if you compare it to the other mushrooms that exist it's not a bad mushroom it's still good i don't think any mushroom is bad no mushroom yeah, there is no bad mushroom but even the edible mushrooms are actually good for your health yeah, yeah. so eat your mushrooms and and then you know you know everyone i think one of the things that i i like to share here is that you know when i i personally started consuming more mushrooms in my diet i mean of course like uh, allergies was one part of it with maybe jasha but uh, with me also i feel like a lot of the things in my day to day life be it, you know menstrual cramps or be it a mood um, you know related thing it, it's it's helped a lot and aided uh, you know day to day life be a lot better mm -hmm. and i'm not just saying this because you know yes we are part of the vedo and we grow mushrooms we love it but like he said we're here to present all the information to you and you make the choice on what's really best for you um and on that note i just want to add ask our last question and we ask this to everyone uh, what's your favorite mushroom and why uh my favorite mushroom is shiitake uh -huh. and uh, that has specifically to do because it's both medicinal and culinary it tastes delicious it's really good for your health and yeah i love it awesome awesome any other questions folks are happy to answer it else you know we can connect offline thank you all so yeah, much so for much. joining in you've been crazy uh it was a wonderful life and i have also learned a lot uh, i don't know about you jashit but i definitely have like been a bit mind blown i think today. i think every conversation with eladri yeah i mean something. i knew most of it but this is this was crazy Uh, thank you all so much yeah, so, so much we love you, you all and uh, uh we hope you have a wonderful wonderful evening uh thank you for tuning in namaste namaste thank you, namaste. Thank you very much eat mushrooms consume mushrooms drink <laughs> mushrooms <laughs> <laughs>